Oh, all right. Hey, everyone. Hope you're doing very well on this wet and windy Wednesday. That's a bit of alliteration there. Um, hope you're all doing well. And today we are joined by one of our clients and friends of Shift Success, which is Joe Smith. Joe is a business spiritual coach, and she's going to share her story of you know getting involved in the police, getting started with this very unique business, and obviously, hopefully, providing lots of inspiration going forward. So, Joe, welcome to the podcast. How are Hi. you? I'm really good, thank you. I'm excited to be here today. Good stuff, good stuff. So what I want to start off by asking, first of all, is how did you end up getting into the police and, you know, how long have you been in the police so far? Yeah, so I've, it's my 25th year anniversary this year, so I've been in it a while. I kind of just fell into it, really. I went to school, left school, went to university, did some travelling, worked in insurance for a bit, and then thought, oh, do you know what, I'll just apply for the police, and that was... That was back in 1997. I took a couple of years out when, um, as a career on a career break when I had my middle daughter. But yeah, the rest is history. And 25 years later, here I am, <laughs> still there. Wow. Okay. And was it kind of like a? Can you remember like a story or like what compelled you to join the police? Because obviously, there's loads of jobs out there. You've been to university. What kind of like inspired you to join the police? I think back in the day, I think it really was. I just want, and it's so cliched because I think a lot of cops can relate to this. I wanted to work in a job where one, I could help people. Two, I didn't want to be stuck in an office. I wanted to be able to get out and about, which is quite ironic because I'm stuck in an office now. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I wanted to be able to get out and about, meet different people and have some, have a job really that was, um, you know, there's lots of different facets to it that I could just try different things. I had no real kind of desire to go down a particular route, but I definitely knew I didn't want to work in an office working Monday to Friday, nine to five. So mm. it seemed to hit all those boxes for me, really. OK. And what did you study at university? I did a degree in geography. And the only reason I did that was the first one in my family to go to university. And the only reason I did that was just because it had really cool field trips and I liked geography. <laughs> so there was really like, yeah, I've never really, I've never used it. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Interesting. So uh, you joined the job, um, 97, you said? Yeah, 1997. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And, and kind of what roles have you done in the police in your, in your kind of service so far? quite a lot so I actually got promoted uh quite early on I think I was promoted within the first six or seven years uh, which back in those days was quite quick um mm -hmm. you know I know people seem to get promoted a lot quicker now but yeah it was quite speedy um frontline um community policing um uh intelligence gosh um and then eventually becoming a detective so I went through the detective and now I'm, I'm still working that space as a as a DCI now so nice nice and you know with regards to your career in the police obviously we know it's challenging it can be frustrating at times when did you first get the inkling of actually oh maybe I could you know go into business I think to be honest with you the, the thought first dropped in my head all the way back in 2017 okay so quite a while away and yeah and I thought oh that might be quite that might be quite cool to kind of just, you know, work for myself and have have flexibility. I was going through quite a tough time at work at that moment. So I think it was like I was just starting to look to see whether I was, you know, I could do anything else. But there was loads of other stuff going on for me personally at the time. So there wasn't really, I didn't really focus on it. I kind of gave it some thought, did a little bit of research and then kind of thought, actually, no, I can't. I haven't got the energy to look at that right now. And, you know, I sort of just stayed where I was because it was comfortable, it was easy and it suited my personal circumstances at the time. So um, and then it wasn't until around about 2020 that I thought, actually, this is something that I really want to really consider. I went off and did a I did a business master's that, uh, that I got through work and. Yep. Um, and that kind of started to light my fire a little bit around other ways that I could use that and all my experience in my job. Um, and also the, um, the side hobby I had of the spirituality side of it and all of that kind of stuff. And I began to think about how I could bring that all together and actually use that rather than speaking and doing things, you know, doing card readings. 
and all that kind of thing um, that I would that I've done for years, but don't do it with friends and family and just kind of for you know for a bit of fun really. So yeah. yeah, that's when that it started to drop in then really. Okay, cool. And you know we're going to go into kind of more deeper on the spiritual side in a second. But was your first kind of introduction into you know the spiritual industry with card reading, or was there something else? So I've um, been psychic, very intuitive read tarot cards, spoken to dead people since I was like 15. Wow. Um, so I've known all my life that I've had this kind of ability to do this. Um, and as my journey in my life has gone on, you know, I went to university, you know, I went to uni, other stuff became more interesting and I kind of dumbed it down. And also I just found throughout my whole life really felt just like I was a bit weird or people just didn't really understand me or, you know, and a lot of people feel like this who work in my space. They feel completely misunderstood. They don't feel like people know that are going to really understand and they think that they're a bit odd and actually I'm just as normal as everybody else. It's just that I do this other stuff. Um, and so, yeah, so it was, it's something I've had all my life but the I kind of didn't understand it and I've sort of grown to learn and develop myself as the years have gone by but yeah predominantly it was um, communicating with spirit through mediumship and reading tarot cards and oracle cards yeah wow wow so we're going to un unpack that so I can remember you know you, what you said there's a lot of people you know might misunderstand you and I can remember when you actually joined shift success and you were talking through your ideas with me you thought that I would, you know, like in discourage you to go down the idea, but um, obviously it's, it's working and, you know, I encourage you to do it. Um, it's a big niche in itself. There's a big interest there, but for you in hindsight, looking back when you first discovered this gift, um, was there a certain story you can share with us when you first, you know, uh, saw a spirit or communicated with, with another world, so to speak? Yeah, for sure. So <laughs> I basically used to hear voices in my head and I thought I was going completely bonkers, basically. I thought I was going to get carted off to, like, some, uh, you know, under a mental health unit. Just used to hear sounds and words and voices um, all the time in my head, in my voice, though, because that's how, that's how it comes through. And it was almost like I was having having a conversation with myself. And it got so bad that I literally would just like, oh, you just stop. It was like, it was so overwhelming because I could, couldn't understand it. And I was only 15, didn't really understand what was going on, thought I was losing my mind. And then I started to um, see things and actually get sort of um, in, information come in about, you know, friends, loved ones that had passed. Um, and it just kind of went on from there. And then I began to talk to people who... Um, uh, from my um, in my family so there's sort of I don't come from a, a, a witchy line although my grandmother on my mum's side was you know very spiritual um, mm. and I've got other family members so I began to just talk to people and just connect and then back in that day as well there was no internet well there wasn't really the internet or anything I just used to read every book I could get hold of in the library and um, come home with arms of books um, my mum rolling her eyes going, oh my God, you know, you could brought loads more books home with you kind of thing. And I was just used to feed myself all this information because I realised that I wasn't going bonkers and I actually was getting those messages and information and guidance coming through for me. But I squashed it down eventually. I squashed it down because I got, um, yeah, I got distracted with, you know, things that you do when you're in your early 20s. <laughs> wow. Wow. Amazing. And, you know, working in the police, uh, you know, do, you, do, you, do your colleagues know you've got this gift? Some or... do. Some do. I don't talk about it that openly at work. Occasionally I talk, I mention it. I mean, I've got friends, obviously, that I have in the workplace that, you know, they know outside, but generally day to day in work, I don't really talk about it. But, um, you know, I have... I could write a book with like the number of interesting stories and of course being a detective as well like you know I'll be like I don't know say you've got like a high risk miss pair or there's a big job going on or something and everybody's going off and doing their things and I'm going well I think we should go and look over here or I think we should consider this over there and they're like but why would we consider that and I'm like well just because that's what I think we should be doing and 
you know, and then I take them, they, they think they're going down a wild goose chase and actually we get to the, the nub of what we need to know. So, wow, oh God. Wow. you know, so I've had, yeah, there's some interesting stories around there. And when I leave, I will think I will be writing some kind of few stories about that. <laughs> Amazing. And what kind of like, you know, messages do you get? Is it, you know, you mentioned guidance there, um, but is there other me like messages that you get to like to be aware of certain things or? Yeah, so basically, so when I started my journey, I started off with mediumship. So people would come to me and ask for a loved one, re you know, readings from their loved ones. And I do that kind of thing. And I, I the way it works, the clairvoyance is the seeing. So that looks like um, the way I describe it is as though a film is being played across in, in my mind's eye. And I can just see images and like footage. It's a bit like one of these like old black and white films that's kind of on a one of those wheelie projectors and it kind of just flashes around. And then I hear I hear words or sentences or information and that just comes through in my voice in a way in language often that doesn't make sense to me or in terms of the wording and the phraseology and that kind of thing but it is in in the way that person would speak so I pass it over in that in that way so that that kind of past loved one work I used to do that a lot I don't do that anymore I don't do specific readings anymore but that's how I started my journey when I started to work with clients um now I now my channel what I call my channel has developed and strengthened over time and I communicate <laughs> I'm gonna blow your audience's mind a little bit here but I <laughs> communicate with multi-dimensions so you know across different um dimensions um aliens you know other beings of light angels all that archangels all that kind of thing as well as guides and people's past loved ones I do all of it wow that's that's insane so uh, i'm interested knowing you like obviously you're on duty obviously in your career i'm sure you've came across sudden deaths and so forth were there instances where you know you'd walk into a you know a sudden death situation where you, you i don't know you felt like an energy or you know you maybe got a, like a uh, maybe a message at all is anything anything like that that's happened yeah i've had i've had that um i mean i haven't gone to those kind of scenes for quite a long time but i do remember going to one death which was um a long time ago now where um it was really sad a child had hanged themselves um off their bunk bed and yeah I got a message through from them to their father um wanting to pass the message and it was one of those things where I was able to deliver it without really telling him how yeah. I was receiving that information. Yeah. And I think, you know, thought, having... You thought a bit like, oh, you know, what are you doing kind well, of Well, it would just be a bit odd, wouldn't it, to have, you know, I was a sergeant at the time. You've got a uniformed sergeant turning up and saying, you know, you, you, your son wants you to know X, Y, Z. I mean, it would mm. just be a bit strange. So, mm. you know, we learn, and I think a lot of the skills that you pick up as a cop, you know, and that, that compassion, that empathy, you know, I, being able to pass messages in the most awful circumstances when you're a police officer has done you know I'm able to pass that information on um in a way when I was doing that kind of work with clients just yeah in a way that I just became so just come so naturally to me to be able to do that wow that's that's amazing um would you so would you clash yourself are you you know are you uh religious at all I'm Christian so I'm just wondering do you with this kind of gift you got you know where do you stand with that I don't, well, I mean, I was raised a Christian. I was raised in a, when I went to primary school, went to a church school, used to go to Sunday school. Yeah. I've had a really funny on-off relationship with church. I mean, if anyone's listening to this and they're thinking, oh God, some of these things that Joe's saying really resonate with me and I'm I'm thinking that maybe something's going on for me. I've been in and out of church so many times in terms mm -hmm. of being completely obsessed with going and you know completely immersing myself into it to completely withdrawing and very often when people are going through what we term a spiritual awakening becoming much more aware about um their own spirituality because we all have spirituality as part of all of us in some shape or form because we've all got a soul and that's you know it's all part of it 
that many people will have that kind of on off relationship with religion. What I do is absolute, you know, I do talk about God in my work, but I also refer to God as source universe. Mm. Um, ultimately it's the higher energetic intelligence that's so much bigger than us that guides us and helps us. We are so on our own with our human brain and our human body we can achieve so much more in our lives and do so much when we actually trust that there's something bigger that's guiding us and helping us in our day-to-day lives, whether that's business, relationships, money, career, you know, whatever it is, just life. Mm. We're being Amazing. looked after. I, I love that. And that's kind of like reassuring, I suppose, in, in a way, because I think there's lots of people we speak to in the police, you know, who are having a tough time. And I think, you know, having... You know, I think it's like Santa Claus. I always explain this, like the, the the theme of Santa Claus is that, you know, it's a good thing, like be good. You know, you're going to get, you know, uh, presents this year, that kind of thing. You make sure you're being good to mom and dad, et cetera. I think that kind of essence in itself as well, you know, being do good to people, you know, be good to your neighbor and so forth. I think that I think is a positive rather than a negative. And I know that, you know, religion can be, a disastrous thing as well but i also think it has a lot of good in the world so it's just interesting to get your thoughts on that and where you sit with it especially with this gift that you've got um so talking about your your business you're a spiritual business coach um and i'm assuming you obviously well i know you help business and entrepreneurs with their business do you want to explain to the people who are watching and listening on the podcast you know how you go about doing that and tying in with spirituality yeah of course so um now I like to, I I absolutely love working with spiritual entrepreneurs they're the people that I love working with although I don't confine my work just purely to spiritual entrepreneurs I have worked with people who have not got spiritual businesses but they working the thought of working with a psychic channel sparks something in them to say actually I'm interested in that so the way I work is that I use my psychic and intuitive channel to download information and insight into somebody's business whether that is around um oh sorry yeah to insight their business and then what that enables me to do is I can look at the blind spots that they can't see because I have this insight and this ability to be able to see what they can't see in their current 3d reality as it were um and i have this ability to use that to help them um to guide them with their niche with with their pricing with their offers with their offer suite with their um you know whether they're actually a really whether they're actually meeting their full potential with what they're actually doing or whether they need to make a shift and sometimes it's only a one degree shift or it could just be refinement their offers might be perfect but there needs to be some shifting to get them to meet their full fullest potential and all that information I get through comes through from my guidance system and I connect into their guides as well so um the and I then blend that with this all the the strategy stuff that I've learned by both from doing my own business and also from the business strategy work that um, learnings that I got from when I was did my master's mm. and then also I'm a master alchem- energy alchemist so any blocks limiting beliefs that's holding them back because no amount of strategy as you well know Alex mm. you can have the best strategy in the world and I can give someone their blueprint for what I think that their business should look like but if they are stuck in that murk of oh, I'm not good enough and I need to go off and do another million courses and I'm too scared to speak up and, you know, and all that stuff going on, they're not going to be able to step into that. So I help shift all of that. And the thing about the way I work is I don't muck around. So people will get those energy shifts really, really quickly so that they can then step in. And, of course, those blocks will come up at every level. You will know when you start up leveling in your business – those you know those voices those kind of you know those thoughts will always drop in and it's about having the tools and the mechanisms and the belief the self-belief to to shift your way through that and that is what I help people with 
I love that. Absolutely love it. And, you know, limiting beliefs are, are a big thing. I mean, we obviously work with, you know, a lot of police officers who are thinking about going to business. That can be um, an issue. With regards to um, limiting beliefs that you've come across, um, what kind of are the most common limiting beliefs have you found working with your clients? Yeah, so some of the most common ones are not feeling good enough, um, not feeling as though they've been in the game long enough, um, not feeling as though they can speak with any level of authority about what they can do, feeling completely misunderstood and not feeling that they can actually get people to understand what they're doing and if they and and that they may suffer with some judgment. Um, a lot of people suffer with um, really, really quite icky money beliefs. So they either come from everything at a place of lack and so therefore underprice themselves, undervalue themselves, or mm -hmm. they feel like they just can't even charge for their services because how can you be a spiritual person and charge? And I, I've been all through this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm out the other side of it now. But that was a huge block for me. Um, and another one is just perfectionism and feeling like they've got to have like the, you know, and a lot of these beliefs are not specific to spiritual business owners, but I do find that so people that are very soul led with their business and want to really want to serve people from almost a very heart place. Not that I'm saying that other types of entrepreneurs don't, but there is something different about those kind of business owners. It's almost like they, that, that manifests even more frequently, I find. Mm, absolutely. And with regards to these limiting beliefs, where do they stem from? Do you think, is it childhood or is it like adulthood? Where do you think it comes from? I think, a lot of it does come from all the pattern stories, um, beliefs that we have grown up with. And they, they, it's a lot of it is ancestral. So a lot of it comes from parents, the way we were brought up, brought up the phrases, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. <laughs> yeah. You, gotta work, you know, you've got to work, you've got to work your ass off to be successful. I'm not saying you shouldn't do hard work, but hustling yourself into the ground to the point that you're so burnt out you can't do anything it's not going to be good for you your business for your family mm. um if you have one um you know those kind of stories and beliefs and that kind of you know um it's definitely it's definitely definitely comes from that and then just and then I think we just layer that all through our lives as, um, and we make decisions and choices and all our behaviors stem from that because we are like sponges when we're kids and that's where we learn and of course our, it's all about blaming our parents because ultimately they brought us up in the best way that they knew so they're the way they've done it is their conditioning from their parents and back and back and back so I spend I do work with cutting those cords and attachments and those beliefs that we have that we had when we were kids and cutting it all the way back so that people can be not it's not about you know blaming and telling them saying it's their fault but changing it for themselves and their for generations to come their kids and their future kids and so on and so forth so they you can bring up your kids so they haven't they're not using those phrases and having that mindset i i love that and i completely agree you know I've, there's a there's a book i read once um it's by an author called robert kiyosaki he's wrote a few books i can't remember which one it's actually from but he says uh, an interesting quote and i completely agree with and he said that poverty is hereditary. And basically what he was stating is that we are taught certain financial habits or beliefs from our parents, which is then passed on to the children, and then they pass on to their children and so forth. And what starts to happen is that as the world changes, that advice they got is it becomes quite damaging for their life. And um, I've always said this too, like, you know, I was born into a family, I was born into a broken family, you know, there wasn't any money around, etc. Mum and dad used to argue about uh, money all the time, you know, being the red, etc. And I made the decision when I started investing in myself, God, when I was 24, that I might have been born into a family like that, but I'll guarantee that my children won't be. Um, and I think that's a good thing, because otherwise, generations can go by being kind of stuck in a rut and i don't think you know you know being money i don't know if money does bring happiness but 
you know, I've been broke and I've had money and I actually think you're able to serve and come from a place of peace more when you have financial resources. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, I think I think that when you've got a business, when you're serving people, the money is the byproduct of the service. The service always comes first and the money comes from that place of service. And I think that um, we've got this really weird kind of thing where it's acceptable to be hand to mouth or to be in debt but it's not but people frown upon people that are really wealthy we've got this kind of like yeah if you're really rich and you're really wealthy that you're mm. you, you turn into an asshole basically and that's obviously mm. not true at all but a lot of people have those beliefs and actually it's almost more accepted that we struggle or that we have you know not that i believe there's anything wrong with debt at all as long as it's leveraged in the right way but that you know that there's this really this like this skewed mindset you know none of us came here actually to be to be um to not have abundance you know we're you know the universe wants us to be abundant beings wants us to achieve that the only people that stand in that way is ourselves for that yeah Yeah. um but yeah i do i do believe that and i do think you know the way the money makes you i've been i've been guilty saying money doesn't make you happy you know money doesn't make you happy well, actually, it does, and I don't think, that, and I think people get really ashamed of saying that money makes you happy because it really does. What would you rather be? Actually, have no money at all and not be able to afford to do anything and living in your overdraft every month and you know, wondering whether you can pay your bills, or would you rather, or would you like money to give you the freedom and the ability to take your family on holiday and to give back and to give to charity and to you know money is a neutral resource there's no power in money it's just a resource that allows us to give and receive back that's yeah. all money we attach so much to it yeah. it becomes such a big block for people i think as well when they're starting a business yeah 100 percent. i think people attach their almost their worth to it um mm-hmm. you know and, and that can have a, a negative impact because if they're not being paid a lot right now they'll go oh this is what I'm worth. And and that's not the case because obviously human beings can grow. And you're right what you said about, you know, there's this, there's almost this like stigma around money. When it comes I, was to, <laughs> yeah, like, it's like, I see it like on like Facebook comments or Facebook groups and the people are like, you know, tax the rich more. I'm like, what you, what you're, what you're saying there is that you, cause no one likes to be taxed. Let's be honest, right? No one wants to be taxed. And when what you're saying subconsciously is that, if you become very wealthy or successful that you're going to get taxed and you're kind of withdrawing or the same thing is said with uh, being lucky, you know, or rich people are lucky. And if you're, if you're thinking like that, you think getting financial success is linked to being lucky. And so you're almost like putting these barriers in place when it comes to your own financial abundance. And, you know, one thing that I think is really encouraging what I learned in my journey is that, there's plenty of money to go around. Like I think a lot of people think that dimming someone else's light when it comes to financial abundance actually, you know, takes away f- from them or or there isn't enough to go around. Um, do, do you find that as well when you're kind of speaking to people or just hearing people talk about money? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, there is there is loads of money circulating. Go to the airport. Yeah. Go to the airport. Yeah. People have got money from all walks of life it's just how they choose to spend it <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and and you know oh the the radio was on the other day because we're they keep talking about we're in a recession don't they yeah. and so i think they've been talking about that for about the last five years i don't listen to the news i don't, I don't listen to the news yeah just no i'm not interested you're in, you're in a recession <laughs> i'm not in a recession yeah That's my mindset yeah exactly and i think that you know but abundance isn't just about money you know it's not it's about how you feel in your life you know I'm I'm really content and happy with my life I love my life you know I've got a great family I've got you know I've got a job that pays me well and I've got an amazing business that pays me well and you know my needs are met my needs are met I want to be an overflow of course I do but I'm really content and I think when you come at life from that place that mm. it all starts with you. Everything mm. all starts with you. And that's a lot of my work is about 
you know, people want to grow their businesses. They want to excel five, five K, 10 K months. That's what they desire. But got to start with them first. If they haven't done the inner work, done that kind of do what desire, deserving it, deserving it. You deserve it. We innately deserve it. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So going on to that then, Joe, like, you know, there's plenty of people in the, in the police force. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of, you know, in public sector workers aren't paid what they deserve to be paid, in my opinion. Um, when people are going through that kind of financial lack mindset or, you know, not being paid their worth, what advice would you give them to overcome that limiting belief when it comes to lack of abundance or money is bad, kind of so to speak? I think it's there's well there's well, there's a number of things really because it depends on what where that stems from mm. some people have that come from um come at money or or lots of things it's often not just money they come at their life in the in a place of lack just generally mm. Mm. or people just really sh- or think they struggle they're going to struggle to hold on to it so they're mm. they're quite happy to charge and then they receive and then the next and then it's all gone and so there's never anything there because they think they've got to keep spending it because they can't if they hold on to it it's all going to disappear anyway so we just mm. get rid of it yeah i think with um why well, i what i i think a lot of the work that i do with my clients is around getting them to um or bringing them into a place where they can truly start looking at what it is how they're transforming their clients what is it that they're actually serving them with and where they were when they first got them to where they are at the end and when they actually look at that journey that they take them on and get the testimonials and the words from their clients who are saying oh my god or you know they just drop into their dms mid mid coaching course or whatever it is they're doing and they're getting oh my god i've just got this this client i just landed this or I just sold this many plate or you know you're getting all that always go back to the testimonials whenever you're coming up against that doubt of oh is it am I undercharging am I overcharging all this kind of thing go back to what your clients are saying I've got on my wall I've got testimonials of people that have given me kind words or emails or whatever it is and I every time I have a doubt I look at it and I see all those words I'm like no, this is I'm what I'm doing is right. I'm what it's working and I'm helping people. Amazing. Amazing. So, you know, let's say, you know, I, you know, I come to you as a client and, you know, Joe, I need help with X, Y, Z. What's kind of the first things you'd identify with a client to, to find out what the issues are first of all, so then you can start working to resolve them. Some of the first things is about asking them, you know, what, what is it that they desire in their business? What is their vision? Mm-hmm because so many people don't even know what they really want. Mm. And, and that's kind of where I first start the journey is it, what is, what is your vision for your business? Yeah. What is, what have you tried so far that is, that's not working for you? How, how is what you're doing currently making you feel or not feel? Mm. And then, looking at what they're currently doing and then taking and then going into okay what is your what is your objective what where do you want to sit what do you see yourself because not everybody wants like mul- you know not everybody wants multiple six figure businesses believe yeah. it or not yeah no it's true yeah i yeah, yeah, not yeah, everybody agree. wants that you know some people do just just want to make just want to make five thousand pound a month that's that's what their aim is and they don't want 10k 20k 30k you know there's this miss but there's this you know especially on social media at the moment oh, i'm a seven figure business coach you know take take you to your first million all this kind of thing yeah, yeah. That isn't that isn't for everybody or it's yeah. not for them now it might be eventually yeah. but it's just not for them now so it's about looking at and also what's really important is is what they're doing and this is when my channel comes in to help is what they're doing do they love it mm. do they love it because if you don't love what you do and i love what i do yeah. if you don't love it it's really hard to sell your stuff mm. because yeah. everything is energy everything from the words that you write to the offers that you put out 
to your emails, to your social media posts, and people can feel it. If you're not 100% behind what it is that you want to sell, mm. you're not going to sell it. Yeah. It's but not. You've got to believe in it. Like, it's, uh, you know, James White, one of our mentors, um, he always says, you know, would you buy your own products? You know, would you buy your own service? If not, then, you know, you're going to have a maybe an incongruency there. So is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah, basically. Yeah, you've got to you've got to believe you've got to love it and you've got to believe the track. You've got to believe that that what you're doing is amazing, mm. that people will be nuts not to buy it. Yeah. And if they don't buy it, they're, you know, obviously don't necessarily say this to clients, although I have said it to some people. Look, if you're going to walk away and say no on this you, you, you're being silly. Yeah, yeah. I have said that bravely, yeah. but I don't say that very often because that's not my style. And normally, by the time people come to me, they kind of, you know, they have a pretty good idea. But, but yeah, it's like, yeah, that's basically what I'm saying. Can you say, I've, yeah, I saw that. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I saw that. Before everyone's wondering what we're talking about there, um, before we went live with the podcast, Joe had a few orbs around her. And Joe, do you want to explain what orbs are, first of all? Yeah, so I see it all the time when I'm doing my client calls. Yeah, um, balls of energy, like energetic energy that's around me. So, okay, that was, that, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it just got a lot of spirit around me because I call it all in before I come on, even before I come on a podcast. Everything I do, I call in my my guys to support me and uh, enable to, for me to be clear to give clarity and to support what the work I'm doing so I love that I love it you put you're pulling in the uh, resources I like that <laughs> yeah always always got my team What's my team <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> Joe, from, you know, being a police officer to now what you're doing in business, um, what kind of skills do you believe you've transferred from, you know, being a police officer over the years to actually being in your, bit, your own business now and, and working with the clients that you do? I think, um, gosh, there's so many really. And I think cops just don't, you just don't really realise it until you actually start working in this, you know, you start having a business. You don't realise if I was talking about this to somebody earlier. Mm. communication the way you can talk to people the ability to be able to problem solve yeah big one um, is massive risk taking taking mm. risks albeit i think some people find that hard i found that difficult um, calculated risks yeah calculated yeah. risks um but, you know, we do need to take risk in business. Isn't that the definition of an entrepreneur, isn't it, in the dictionary? Yeah. Risk and it, making. Yeah, you're right. And, and here's the thing, like, there's always a risk in life. There's a risk working in the police, not only in terms of, like, what can happen on duty, but also a risk in not being paid your worth and missing out on special moments in life. Or it could be there's a risk thing you drive to work every single day. There's always a risk. And here's the one thing that helped me is that we're not getting out of life alive we're all gonna die <laughs> so that's kind, of, that's kind of that's helped me like we're all gonna die we're all, we've got tiptoe our way safely to death it makes no sense to me so no, sorry no, to life is very short alex we're on this it's you know in all our lifetimes that we have um which is another rabbit hole that we won't go down but you know we're here it's a blink of an eye and it's gone yeah um, but yeah so communication skills problem solving being able to make quick decisions about things and actually taking action and making decisions on things that are not working and actually saying, okay, now it's time to pivot, do something different. I've tried that, didn't go quite the way I wanted to. Being really flexible and open-minded, I think cops are great at that. Yes. Um, I mean, yeah, there's... Yeah. And obviously, you know, if you go into coaching or in any business, actually, the ability to be able to talk to people and actually... Our interviewing skills, being able to reflect back to people when you're speaking to them on the phone, you know, really building that rapport and that empathy. Um, and yeah, I think, gosh, it's just the list is endless, actually. Mm. So many, so many. Completely agree. Completely agree. So, Joe, you've been obviously started the business and now, you know, you're, you're making thousands per month from your business, which is amazing. It's a great to see. You're always in our community as well, like posting your wins, sharing your feedback, et cetera. And obviously you've been a member of the month a few times as well, which has just been 
incredible. Um, for you and you know your story for where you started in business, what's some kind of advice you'd give to a police officer who is maybe watching from the sidelines, they're a bit miserable, they want to start a business, but they're just lacking that confidence or kind of, you know, a bit, I don't know, a bit scared in all, in all honesty. What kind of advice would you give based on your situation? I think from my <laughs> situation, I started off doing something that I don't do anymore. You know, I used to go to psychic fairs and do readings. I had an Etsy shop, you know, it was very kind of low, lower price, very kind of you know lower level stuff and because it enabled me just to get used to actually being paid for something that I was doing and it 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 got began to build my confidence and everyone's different you know some people were happy to throw themselves into the really high value offer um that wasn't me and that's okay because everyone's different ultimately you know that's you can still do really well on on lower price stuff you don't have to go into high but obviously you know it's all about time and stuff mm. so definitely don't be afraid to try just give it a go because if it doesn't work you can pivot and do something else yeah you're probably not a million miles away from something actually that is right for you and I do think that a lot I think people think that they have to do something really different that they have to do they have to I mean it's great if you can invent something and you're drag you know and that's how your brain works and you're you know you're on dragon's thing you've invented something that kind of thing but it doesn't have to be like that we don't have to reinvent the book there are lots of people who are psychic business coaches out there channelers who do what I do there's loads of people but there's only one me Mm. and there's only one me that some people want to work with and and that's that's the thing it's about yes there might be lots of coaches out there or whatever it is that you're doing but there is only one you and you only have you had the way you deliver it and the way you help people is unique to you and that's people buy with emotions not with oh well there's 30 you know there's thirty five thousand coaches out there yeah completely agree and and you know, just to touch on that as well. It's like the the laws of economics. Let's say there was 10 million coaches doing exactly the same thing as you, Joe, but there's 7 billion people out there. Well, the the economics are there. The supply demand is still there. And I think a lot of people do stress about, oh, there's so many people doing what I want to do. That's a good thing because it shows demand, but also, well, there's plenty of customers to go around. And that, again, is an abundance mindset, right? It's like thinking... You know, I don't need millions of customers. I need a handful of customers who are going to resonate with my message and what I'm offering. Yeah. So, um, yeah, completely. The other big thing is around the comparison piece. I think a lot of people start, and I'm guilty of this as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, is you compare yourself to people, other people. You know, you're on your Instagram page or mm. whatever. You know, I'm based. I generally use Instagram, but and Facebook, but. You know, you're on your Instagram and you're looking at all these people out there who are talking about how many what their income months have been and they're shoving client testimonials out there left, right and centre and you're looking at them and you're thinking, why is that not me? I want to be like that. I can't get there. No one talks about the five, seven, ten years that sat behind where they've been where you are at the beginning. Yeah. You're seeing that you're only seeing it now because you're interested in it. It's a bit like if you want to go and buy a yellow car. And yes. Then you keep seeing the <laughs> yes. It's your is it what's it called? Your reticulating activating Something system. Something like that. Yeah. 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 As soon as you start focusing on it, you see loads of it, and then you're like, you you just then you're just in that comparison space of comparison, and that is the big. That is probably one of the biggest blocks to moving forwards is comparing <laughs> yourself to other people. Yes. Yeah, just, just stop just stop. it's like a almost like a toxic comparison but what people yeah. don't realize is that you know you don't and this is a quote that i've heard don't compare your chapter one to someone else's chapter 40 you know yeah. they they started before you they've been through the trial and error they've you know built the confidence and if you're just starting just realize that they were once a starter they just started yeah. before you that's that's basically yeah. it so completely agree to toxic comparison is you know, can be a massive negative. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, I suppose it can be 
a positive if it inspires you so if it, it inspires you but yeah. if you start to fall into self-doubt and yes you know, you know all that self-deprecating talk yes you know, stop and you know the best some of the you know the most successful business people in the world you know the Richard Branson's you know the billionaires out there mm-hmm. multi-millionaires you know they will talk really openly about you know where they came from and the you know all the calamities that they had along the way it's not to say they have to have a complete disaster but yeah. no one went from naught to a billion yeah it, it naught to a million I mean I'm not I'm not I'm not saying growth has to always be incremental because I do believe it can be exponential it does yeah. depend on a number of factors yeah um but yeah it's it's just not it's not helpful it no. really isn't and if you have you know and if you are someone that struggles with that you're just making it worse really yeah completely agree completely agree so joe what's some of the kind of mistakes what you made when you start in your business you know i've made plenty of mistakes in, in all my businesses starting out um, and still do to this day in fact um and that's uh, you know it's okay because you, you learn from them but what are some of the mistakes you found with with this business when starting out would you say boundaries <laughs> boundaries what i would say what so client client boundaries. boundaries mine and theirs actually yeah okay. so leaky boundaries by and i mean what i mean by that is um not oh sorry i just got a notification there let's get rid of that um not holding boundaries with clients so not and I'm not this is not me saying that I won't be flexible with clients so you know sometimes calls do overrun and sometimes I might send them an extra message on top of what I would normally say as part of the program that we're in or whatever that's not what this is about because Mm -hmm. I'm making that conscious decision to do that and you know my boundaries really firm around that and that's my choice but it's when you start to overgive even though you've said that you're going to set certain limits on what you're offering and you start giving so much more and before and and getting almost emotionally involved with the Mm. client's problems and then starting to take them on as your own I think you see a lot of that especially when you work with empaths and people that have you know who work in that kind of space the healers and that kind of thing Mm. they can they can start taking on their own so definitely that was something I did in the beginning. Yeah. Which was helpful. Um I'm I underpriced myself in the beginning, but mm-hmm. it was comfortable for me. Yeah. <laughs> it was just a journey I had to go on. I look back and I'm thinking, goodness, I wouldn't do that now. But it was just a journey that I went on. And I firmly believe in divine timing and I've got to where I am now because it's the right time for me. Um that's it I wouldn't class it necessarily as a mistake Mm -hmm. but knowing your value from the very beginning is is key actually it's key to getting the success I sort of think would you know not that the past matters because all that matters is today Mm -hmm. would I have moved further forwards quicker possibly but again the journey is the journey because that was the one I was meant to go on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I always believe that. Um, any other mistakes? Spreading myself too thin. So trying to be everywhere all of the time. So Facebook, Instagram, you know, all the platforms, TikTok, you know, e- you know, everything. Just trying to put everything out all of the time just burnt me out because I thought if I didn't do something, I would be missing out on potential clients. Um. So, yeah, I became very clear on where I wanted to. And then um, when I first moved into the coaching space, not becoming really specific about who I wanted to work with, that was something else. I I brought that right in now. So like niched in that further with you. Yeah. Yeah. I've niched right down now. I think. um, Yeah, I was definitely that in the early stages of the mindset that, well, I want to serve everybody. And again, that's another thing around people that work in my space. We just want to help everybody. But yeah. we can't help everybody. So yeah, just, yeah, it's true. You know, yeah. So I think they're some of the biggest ones. Amazing. No, great, great. Honestly, it's, that's really good because obviously people can obviously avoid them, but also to get your experience and to put it into their own position. If they're making them right now, 
then you know it's probably not a path to go on um how do you feel now you know you're making great money from your business which is amazing um to see your journey from where you were to now is is incredible but how do you feel about you know working in the police now compared to your business do you feel like now you've got the business up and running and you're making great money there is the job a bit more enjoyable or you know bearable some people find it more bearable because that financial pressure's off them because they've got the business or some people just go oh my god I, I can't wait to jump ship yes for you how are you feeling about the job <laughs> so work for me is something that I'm going to continue with for the foreseeable I don't hate my job I don't mm. hate my job at all good, good. um and I think that because, because I am really grateful for it. I've mm -hmm. learned, you know, everything I've got from working, doing my job. I work with great people. Um, everything that I've, um, you know, all that I've learned that I've been able to bring into doing the business um, is invaluable. And I'm so grateful. And I get money for doing something that I don't absolutely hate. I never have really hated it. Yeah. Um, the difference is that I'm now at 25 years service. So, yeah. you know, I have got an option now to come away. So I'll be having those conversations to see what that feels like and looks like for me. So I, I'm at that stage now where I wouldn't be leaving because I'm so desperate to go. Where do I sign? That's, yeah. and I don't, I, ne I don't want to leave like that because actually I've got so much, so many good memories and I don't want to feel like I'm leaving because I hate it so much I've got to get out and I feel I never set my business up because I wanted to specifically leave policing I mm. let I set my business up because I knew it was my soul's purpose to do it and that it would be something that I would want to do once I was no longer a police officer however that transpired got it so you almost like future proofing it's like you know I, I get to do something i love i'm 25 yeah. years in the job right now and yeah. you know who knows what the future is going to hold well exactly at least i've got that. something there just in case exactly. i fire yeah. early or whatever yeah you give yourself choice yeah and i i think that you know if i was i have never been so i've never been tired thinking oh I can't ever leave because of the pension I've never thought like that I thought I will go when it's time for me to go mm. and yeah maybe that's maybe that's imminent we'll see we'll yeah. see no, but, it's, it's inspiring you know, it's, it's really nice to hear that as well it's refreshing too because you know as you know a lot of people dislike the job oh, and yeah. and there's a lot of people some people who love the job as well to hear you say that you actually enjoy it and it's just actually a part of your evolution part of your your journey for yeah potentially life after the police i think that's a sensible thing to do and also you've given yourself choice that's that's what it's all about right yeah 100 percent. and i think that actually when you reframe how you feel about something that maybe you're not completely enjoying and you're looking to do something else when you reframe it and say actually what does that give me now what what does it bring me you know it puts a roof over my head it pays the bills it gives my food you know all of that sort of stuff the gratitude piece yeah it makes building your business come from a place of a, a less stressful pressure yes. place i Completely. know that pressure does sometimes you know i know that some people just say i'll oh, sod it and leap and go i know yeah. people who do that yeah but everyone's different. My nervous system couldn't cope with that. Yeah, yeah honestly, <laughs> we don't recommend it. I need a regulated nervous system for yeah. my clients. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, so for me, that was never going to be an option. Yeah. But, you know, I feel like the the having the having that, being so grateful for everything that I have already has allowed me to build my business to where it is today and i and i do think i do believe that a gratitude is yeah. is just just such a huge part of success i think yeah yeah i completely agree and, and i completely agree you know the best time to start a business is when you have a job you know because you that's gonna you know you've got finances there you can plan better We've actually yeah. found as well, people are actually more productive when they have a job due to, um, it's, not, it's not Murphy's law, it's, it's a Parkinson's law. Basically, the time yeah. you give to a task, it takes that time to give. So you've got four days off, as an example, right, I've got to get it all done there, rather than 
oh, I've got all week to do this. I can, you know, do it whenever. So yeah, there's many, many benefits. And everyone watching this, I highly recommend if you are thinking about business, don't leave the job, do it while you're working full-time or part-time. It's a much better place to go from. Um, so Joe, what kind of, um, what's some of your biggest like lessons would you say that have um, helped you in business so far? <laughs> Sorry, say that again, because I thought I was going to have a choking fit. <laughs> oh, it's okay. So what would you say has been some of your biggest lessons in business so far that it's helped you, whether you learned that from, you know, university, shift success, or just your experience? Uh, oh, goodness me. Um, <laughs> biggest lessons. So consistency. Mm, big one. Keep showing up. Yeah. As yourself. Yeah. Be yourself. Again, I went through all of this at the beginning. I didn't, I kind of, I knew who, you know, when somebody says, well, of course I know who I am. I, you know, I live in my body every day. But so many people have this like identity almost crisis when actually they're like, well, I don't actually know who I am. What are my values? What is it that, who are the types of people I want to work with? Who are mm. my dreamy clients that I can't wait to speak to? And so understanding who you are, um, and an identity your identity is really important I think mm -hmm. and and when you know who you are and trusting that actually people want to see you for you and not some vanilla watered down <laughs> version yeah. of something that you think they might want to see online yeah it, that's when you can start being more consistent trying to be consistent from a place of not you is yeah. really hard work it's exhausting yeah so the identity thing there what we, we, like you mentioned a lot of cops do tie their own identity as being a police officer like how would you recommend someone's detaches themselves from that because obviously they weren't they didn't have that identity before the uniform and all of a sudden they've kind of molded this identity to the uniform now so how do they detach themselves do you think from that it's hard isn't it it's hard because i think as police officers um it's kind of almost becomes a way of life rather than just mm. being a job you become hyper what's the word hyper hyper vigilant yeah, but you know what i mean there's like this and i don't think you ever probably ever lose that mm. um i think for me i mean i've never seen my had an identity crisis in terms of um being attached to policing my identity crisis came about coming out the broom closet basically yeah. and opening myself that way um because I just my job was my job that paid the bills don't yeah. get me wrong way back at the beginning of my service I was absolutely obsessed you know everything was work all my friends were police officers I didn't do anything without being something related to policing used to socialize in police premises go to the police mm -hmm. bar you know everything was work related as I've got older, had a family, you know, I can, I haven't got that many friends from work that I see outside of work. Yeah. Most friends are not police officers. I do other stuff. Mm -hmm. Policing is a job that I go to every day. And when I leave at the end of the day, I've worked hard on this, trust me. And I know mm -hmm. there will be a lot of people listening, watching this, like thinking, how do you do this? But that's it. I close my laptop. Don't get me wrong. There will be some days when I might have to do a bit more, but yeah. generally speaking, I'm not. I'm Joe Smith. I'm yeah. not police detective Joe Smith. Do you know yeah. What I mean? yeah, completely understand. And, and I think it's just about having that out, having stuff outside of work to take mm. you away from the environment. It's not healthy. I don't think. Mm. Yeah. No, I completely agree with you, Joe. Um. With regards to your business and you know the vision that you have for the business, where do you, where do you see that going? Where do, where do you visualize your business going in you know five years time? Say, I hope that my business will have grown significantly mm -hmm. and that it will be giving me an income that allows me to have the freedom and the joy that was one of the reasons why I started it to start with. So mm. be able to provide for my family, give back to members of my family um, and to be in overflow to the point that 
I don't actually have to have second best on anything. Mm. Um, and it's, but also to be in a position where the people that I help have got their own wildly successful businesses. That is, that is why I do what I do. Domino because effect. Not, yeah. It's the ripple effect for me. A hundred percent. I want to be able to say, cause it doesn't matter to me if somebody works with me and they've got, you know, they're a six figure business owner. Mm. It doesn't bother me. Mm. Um, it's not about me matching them. It's about me accelerating and elevating them so that they can be the best that they can be. And yes. so if I've, you know, created that for other people so that they can then serve people in the way that they do, then for me, that's, that's a win. <laughs> Amazing. That's, that's a strong, that's a strong reason why for your clients. I love that. What kind of, you know, talking about reasons why, what's your personal reason why for starting in business? Like for me, you know, I'm not a father yet, but like I said, the start of the podcast, you know, I want to make sure that I'm raising my kids different to how I was raised. For you, what's your personal reason why of starting the business? Predominantly because I wanted to be able to have some more freedom and not be, not leave policing, think, you know, because at the end of the day, I've still got young children. I'm not that old myself. I'm old enough, but I'm not that old. I'm not going to disclose that publicly here. <laughs> but as people that know me will know how old I am, but you know, I'm not going to be able to just leave policing and go and live in the Cayman Islands for the rest of my life. It's not, mm. you know, I've got kids to uni or, mm. you know, I have a mortgage and, and I wanted to have the ability to still continue to work and earn money, but doing it on my terms and not having to be working for anybody else. I love that. I've done that enough. You love that. So it's almost like a freedom. Yes, 100%. I love that. Um, Joe, where can people find out more about you? Where can they stalk you, check you out, etc.? Yes, so you can find me in the main on Instagram. So my handle on Instagram is joe underscore the underscore channel. And you can find me on Instagram. And you can find me on Facebook under the same handle. Um, so, yeah, please come and check me out. Come and give me a follow um and because uh, i'd love to chat and if you're interested in anything i've chatted about today then please just drop me a dm in instagram and i'd love to have a conversation there's never any pressure from me so but if you're intrigued then i'd love to meet you in the dm <laughs> amazing joe and one of the last questions we always ask everyone who joins the podcast is what does entrepreneurship mean to you personally do you know what? It means, for me personally, it means doing it even when it feels like it's not working. Just take it each step because you don't know what the end journey journey is. We, we don't know what the end point is. And actually, it might turn out more miraculous than you ever thought possible. I love that. Absolutely love it. Joe, you've been an absolute inspiration. I just want to say, you know, on behalf of myself and the team to see where you are starting this, this business to, you know, helping and creating a massive impact with your own clients to making thousands, your own business to how you feel about the future now is, is really inspirational. We are very, very proud of you. So thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, this is going to go live on the podcast um, later in the week. Um, you're going to do amazing things. I know this is just the start of your journey. And uh, you've got, yeah, a very, very exciting head, uh, journey ahead. So uh, thank you, Joe. And thank you for thank everyone you, who's Alan. tuned in. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see your next step. Brilliant. Thanks so much. It's been a take, pleasure. Take care, everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye. See ya.